virtually all of us have heard this story over and over and over again. If your schools were anything like the public schools I went to, virtually all of us, all of us have heard the story of the pilgrims, that little group who in 1620 uh, jumped off the Mayflower and, and, and brought Calvinism and also the concept of marriage as a strictly civil contract to our shores. We've all heard that, but at exactly the same time the pilgrims arrived, there were absolutely amazing, miraculous events happening to Catholics elsewhere in what's now the United States. And virtually none of us have probably heard those stories, so this morning we'll change that. Now, today I've used way too many sources to name in a sermon. I've also spliced, cut, pasted, and edited some of the quotes for clarity. Okay. In the 1620s, a Franciscan friar, Fr. Lanza de Benavides, was the superior of the Franciscan missions in what's now New Mexico and Texas. And each summer, starting in 1620, a dozen Humano Indians would show up and ask Father Benavides to send missionaries to their people who live far to the east in an area which is now part of East Texas and Western Louisiana. He could never meet their request because he just didn't have enough priests. On June 3, 1629, a supply caravan from Mexico City arrived in Aleda, New Mexico. That's a mission 14 miles south of Albuquerque. It's still there, of course. The caravan had a military escort, 30 priests, 36 ox carts of supplies and provisions, and also a letter of inquiry written in May of 1628, a year before, written by the Archbishop of Mexico City. The Archbishop wanted Father Benavides to determine if any Indians had shown previous knowledge of our holy Catholic faith, and if so, Father Benavides was to determine how these tribes had acquired this knowledge and then informed the Archbishop of the results, quote, for the greater spiritual and temporal advancement to the glory and service of our Lord, close quote. Now, the obvious question is, why on earth would the Archbishop of Mexico City burden his priests working in the most remote missions with the task of finding out if any tribes of Indians had knowledge of the Catholic faith before the arrival of missionaries? And the answer is, Archbishop had received a remarkable letter from Spain, is written by the confessor of a cloistered Franciscan nun. Since 1620, while she was in prayer, this young nun had found herself in the territories of the New World. She named a few of the tribes she had visited, including the Manos. She could describe specific details about the geography and individual Indians. The Superior General of the Franciscans had met this nun and been favorably impressed with her and her stories. So with his approval, her confessor wrote to the Archbishop of Mexico City. And after reading the letter, the Archbishop himself was sufficiently impressed with the stories about this young sister that he ordered this investigation. On July 22, 1629, only a few weeks after Father Benavides received the Archbishop's letter, a band of 50 Humano Indians, including a one-eyed chief, Chief Tuerto, Capitan Tuerto, showed up at Aileda and presented themselves, again insisting that the priests come to their people. The Franciscans asked, why have you come? The Humanos responded, we have been instructed by a beautiful girl and we wish to be baptized. The priests invited the Humano leaders inside. Capitan Tuerto pointed to a portrait on the wall of an elderly conceptionist nun and said, a woman in similar clothing wanders among us preaching. The priest asked if it were the same nun. No, Our Lady in blue is much, much younger and far more beautiful. She comes to us flying through the sky. Obviously, the situation called for investigation. So within a few days, two priests, three soldiers, and the 50 Humano Indians were on the trail back to the Humano camp. After covering over 500 miles in 10 days, of hard travel, they came to the upper Red River on the side of what is now Wichita Falls, Texas. And they walked into 12 Humano Scouts who were very excited to see them and promptly knelt down, kissed the hems of the friars' habits, and then venerated the crosses that the friars were wearing around their necks. The scouts said that they had been sent to ask the priests to hurry. The medicine men were telling everybody that the whole tribe was going to have to move camp immediately to new hunting grounds. 
since the priests were never going to come, the 50 men were never going to return, and the lady in blue could not be trusted. But the lady in blue had then appeared and told everybody to wait a few days and to send scouts ahead to this exact spot in order to greet the priests. After meeting the priests, the scouts ran back to tell everybody that the priests were indeed on their way and that everything that the lady in blue had told them was true. Before the priests arrived, she appeared again to help the tribe decorate a large wooden cross with flowers, and then she told them how to go out to meet the priests carrying the cross in front of the whole tribe, which is exactly how the priests met the entire tribe in procession behind a cross decorated with flowers. The chiefs told the Franciscans their people wished to be baptized. So the priests asked the chiefs to have everyone who actually wanted to be baptized to raise their hands so that they would know who they had to attend to. Everyone raised their hands, and the mothers even held up the hands of the little infants. So the priests started by catechizing the people and then baptized them. The whole time this is going on, which took some time, representatives of other tribes kept showing up in camp and insisting that their people be baptized as well. When the priests asked what had prompted them to show up at the camp of the Humanos, they told them that the lady in blue had been visiting them and teaching them. Before it was all said and done, the two Franciscans baptized some 10,000 Indians. Now just take a moment to stop and think about that. 10,000 baptisms. That's more than three Pentecosts. 10,000. They told the Humanas they had to return to their mission and give a full report of everything they had seen, but they promised to return and establish a permanent mission. Before the priests left, the Humanas brought out their sick and crippled and asked the priests to heal them. So the true fires walked along, and as one priest read passages from the Gospel of St. Luke about our Lord healing the sick, they made the sign of the cross over each individual, and the sick were healed immediately. As one of these friars wrote, quote, more than 200 were cured in this manner. Close quote. After the priest returned to New Mexico and described what they had seen to Father Benavides, he set out for Mexico City to report to the archbishop. Then he was sent on to Spain. Now, parenthetical remark, some years later when the great Jesuit explorer, Father Kino and his companions, hit northern Sonora and what's now western and southern Arizona, he was visiting the Pima, Yuma Indians, and other Indians in that area. The Indians kept telling him about visits that they had earlier on from a beautiful white woman carrying a cross, dressed in blue with a black covering on her head, who spoke to them and then flew off through the air. All right, back to Father Benavides. He wrote a 111-page initial report for church officials and the king of Spain, in which he described the missions and the some 60,000 Catholic Indians living in what's now New Mexico and Texas and also told the story of the Lady of Blue in the miraculous conversion of the Humano tribe. While Father Benavides was visiting with the superior general of his order, the superior general told him who the Lady in Blue actually was. And so it happened that in late April of 1631, Father Benavides traveled to northeastern Spain to the very Franciscan convent of the poor Clares of the Immaculate Conception in which the Lady in Blue actually lived. And he had the opportunity to interview her face-to-face in the presence of her confessor. She had to be put under obedience to tell everything she knew about her visits to the New World. Otherwise, in her humility, she wasn't going to reveal anything. Father Benavides wrote down what he had learned in the interview and sent copies to Pope Urban VIII, to King Felipe IV of Spain, and, of course, to the Franciscans back in the New World. Father Benavides, quote, First of all, I must state that Maria of Jesus has a beautiful face, very white, although rosy, with large black eyes. Her habit is the same as ours, made of coarse gray sackcloth. Over this gray habit comes one of coarse white sackcloth with a scapular made of the same material in the court of our father, St. Francis. Over the scapular is a rosary. The cloak is of heavy blue sackcloth, and she wears a black veil. She told me so many tales of the New World that I did not even remember them myself, and she brought them back to my mind. This Blessed Mother told me that she had been present with me at the baptism of Piros, that's a tribe in New Mexico, and she recognized me as the one she had seen there. Likewise, she had helped Father Kiros with some baptisms, giving a minute description of his person and face. Once when the Father was in his church baptizing, many Indians came in and all crowded around the door, and that she, with her own hands, pushed them on, getting them to their own places so they would not hinder him. They looked to see who was pushing them, and they laughed when they were unable to see who did it. 
She also told me about all that we know that has happened to the two priests in their journeys to the Humanos. And she asked that she asked the Humanos to go and call the fathers as they did. She knows Capitan Tuerto very well, giving a detailed description of him and of the others. She gave me all their descriptions, adding that she assisted them. She convinced me absolutely by describing to me all the things in New Mexico as I have seen them myself, as well as by other details which I shall keep within my soul. I call God to witness that my esteem for her holiness has been increased more by the noble qualities which I discern in her than by all the miracles which she has wrought in America. Close quotes. In her own letters, Sister Maria said, quote, The events which I have reported to Father Venevides during the interview happened to me from the year 1620 to the present year, 1631, in the kingdoms of Quivera. Now, that's Gran Quivera. That's a pueblo in, in eastern New Mexico. In the kingdoms of Quivera and Humanus, which were the last ones where I was transported. Close quote. All in all, the Lady in Blue bilocated over 500 times from her cloistered convent to the New World sometimes making as many as four trips per day, visiting tribes in a range stretching from East Texas across New Mexico all the way to western Arizona, all in order to prepare these pagan peoples for the preaching of the true faith, the faith without which it is impossible to please God. The Lady in Blue died in 1665, and her body is still incorrupt. It's been in the 90s uh, since they last checked at 89, 91, something like that. And she's just as fresh as if she laid down to sleep uh, a few hours before. There's much more that could be said about her. For example, in 1995, Rio Tevisian Espanol named her as one of the nine most influential women in Spanish history. Let's just end by noting that although her missionary work in the American Southwest is truly amazing, in our day and age, Most people know her because of another work she did, the mystical city of God. See, the Lady in Blue is a venerable Mary of Agreda. So from now on, whenever you hear something about pilgrims bringing Calvinism to our shores, think about this poor Claire of the Immaculate Conception bilocating from Spain to bring salvation to our shores.